Well, if you got your Bibles today, I want you to turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. If you haven't been with us in the last couple of weeks, as you just saw on the bumper, we're in the we're in a week three of a series to where we're just walking through this letter by James to these persecuted Christians of the first century that were spread out all around the area and who kind of lived in a culture that in many ways, in many, many ways, resembles the culture that we live in today. Their culture had this harshness towards true Christians. It had this persecution to true Christians and really, there was just this feeling, this general feeling that was speaking towards Christians of why can't you just be like everyone else? Why can't you just morph with the times? Why can't you just give with the motion of where things are going? Well, James, the half-brother of Jesus, sees this happening. He's the leader of the church of Jerusalem, and he writes this letter to encourage all of these persecuted believers. And he gives them, and he gives us this battle cry or this idea of that we can live, that we can live out our faith by standing or by abiding in even the harsh times. Chapter 1, so far, the first 18 verses, James has really leaned into this idea that we can glorify God in the trials of life. That these trials mold us and they shape us and they point us towards the kingdom of God. And as we live for God in these trials, what we're doing is we're proving what God has done in us. And how God has blessed us. And really, he's saying that as we live in these trials for the kingdom of God, that we are living in a way that ensures that one day we receive the crown of eternity. So for the last couple weeks, it's kind of been this 50,000 foot view of trials and temptation. But today, James shifts gears a little bit. And James goes from kind of this 50,000 foot view to today he gets super practical. All right, He gets super, super practical. And here's what James is going to do today. He's going to lay out a game plan today for not only walking with God in times of trials or times of temptations or when God is doing okay, but James today gives all true believers, he gives all true Christians an important reminder today. And that is this, that we don't just have to eke by in our faith, but we as believers in Jesus as worshipers of Jesus, that we can, in fact, live in the blessings of God. That we can live in his blessings. So today in James, here's what we're going to do. As a child of the king today, we're going to look at a passage of scripture that tells you and tells me that I just don't have to beg God to get by, but I can live in his abundance. I can live in the John 10, 10 abundant life. So let me mention this and then we'll move on. Today is one of those passages that that we need to often come to. And here's why. Because today's passage hits all of us. If you know Jesus today, there is going to be part of today's passage that really and truly speaks into you. Here's what I mean by that. If you've ever been frustrated at anybody in your entire life, today's passage is for you. All right. If you've ever struggled to listen to God at any point in your life, today's passage is for you. If you've ever been guilty of reading the Bible and just closing it and going off and doing your own thing, today's passage is for you. If you've ever been a person that speaks before you think, Today's passage is for you, right? If you've ever been a person that have ever wondered, can I really live for Jesus? It's for you. And last of all, if you've ever been a person that has ever wondered, can I live in the blessing of God? Today is for you, all right? So what we're gonna do today, all right? I'm gonna give you that front. What we're gonna do, I'm gonna read the passage. We're gonna pull some truths from the passage and I wanna give you a game plan today of how you can walk this path of blessings, all right? So here it is. I'm gonna read the whole passage. I don't always do that, but then we're gonna come back to it and just pull some chunks out. James chapter one, right where we left off last week, starting in verse 19. Here's what it says. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. In other words, hey, you need to know this, all right? Even write this down. Here's what he says. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. 
Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror, but after looking at himself, he goes off or goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Notice to use he and not she there because that would never happen, right? Here it is. Verse 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, And continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. Watch what he says. They will be blessed in what they do. Now look, I know that's a lot. It's a lot. But I love what James does here because James, he doesn't waste any time getting into the weeds. But I'm thankful. And here's why I'm thankful. I'm thankful because most of the time, we as people, we respond best to just frank conversations, don't we? Don't beat around the bush. Don't give me a whole bunch of of, of stuff around it. God, just tell me what I need to do and how I need to do it and how I need to walk. And that is exactly what James does for us. James looks at you and he looks at me and he says in context, hey, I know that life has gotten tough and I know that it seems like the cards are against you and I know it seems like nobody can relate to where you are. But then he looks looks at us and says, but God can. God can. And then we say, well, how can God relate if nobody else can relate? God can relate. Here's why, believer, because you're his. You're his son or you're his daughter. And God wants you. He wants you to not just eke through this life in a miserable context. No, God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. I'm so tired of defeated Christians. I'm so tired of Christians that walk around with this ho-hum mindset. Man, we have been set free. We have eternity. We have the Father. And what James is going to point to here is he's going to say, God wants to give you all of this, but, but, here it is. But you play a part in it. But you play a part in it. Now, the but always gets us, right? That's the part that's always hard. James says, look, God wants to do all these things. He wants to give you joy and he wants to give you life. And he wants to give you life more abundantly. But we play a part in it. Now, when I say that James is laying out, right, the pathway to blessings or or life with Jesus, I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. I'm not saying, God, give me millions, right? Let me win the lottery, right? Let my whole family just be totally blessed. that's That's not what I'm saying here. But what I'm saying is, is that God really does want you to have his fullness. He he wants you to have his joy. He wants you to have his power. He wants you to be blessed as his son or daughter. So today I'm going to point out, just as as frankly as possible, what it looks like to walk in the full blessing of God. Now, all cards on the table. Here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to give you five steps, five steps on this pathway, and then I'm going to show you the result of that. But here's what I want you to do this week. Monday through Friday of this week, I want you to pull one of these out. One every single day. All right, they're one-liners, one every day. And I just want you to offer it up before God and go, God, where am I? Where am I in this one? All right, where am I and how am I walking in this one? All right, and just offer it to him. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Look back at the text. Let's pull it into some manageable pieces. It's so practical. It it really teaches itself, but that's not gonna happen because that's not job security. Here we go, verse 19. All right, here it is. Here's what it says. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Here's what he says. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, this is the first one. Write it down so you'll have it this week. Number one pathway to blessing is to listen before you speak. Listen before you speak. Now, it gets up in our business quick, does it not? Amen. It does real quickly. 
I mean, out of all the things that James could have brought up first in being blessed by God in this blessed section, why in the world start here, right? Why start here? Well, I know why he starts here. I mean, let's just get real for a minute and admit, this is hard. It is hard to listen before you speak. It's just hard. I mean, how many of you would just say today, just honestly today, if we were to just kind of do a little quick poll in the room, how many of you would just raise your hand today and go, Matt, one of my superpowers is that I am an amazing listener. <laughs> Nobody, right? I mean, none of us would probably say, there's like maybe two weird people, but I mean the rest, right? None of us would say that because we're not good at listening. We're just not good. In fact, I would bet that about 70% of the time, I made that number up just so you'd listen, it means nothing, but I bet about 70% of the time that that you're listening to another person or if you're listening to God, the reality is is that you're really not listening. All you're really trying to do, because you're just like me, is just to get enough of that conversation so that I can have a rebuttal ready so that I don't look dumb or look ignorant in the conversation. Amen? Anybody ever been there before? Yeah? It's, It's what we do. Many times you don't even really care that the other person is talking or even that God is speaking into you. You just don't want to be caught guilty or dumb when you speak back because you're not listening to the conversation. It's what we do. I love the two descriptions that he uses in verse 19. Look at the two words that he uses. He uses the words quick and slow. Quick and slow. In reality, those two words, they describe all of us, do they not? They do. They absolutely describe all of us. The problem is, it's just more commonly, we operate in the opposite way that God is telling us to work here. I mean, most of the time, we're quick to speak and slow to listen. But why? You ever thought about why that is? I think I came up with the why this week. It just hit me. Here's why. I think that we're so quick to speak and so slow to listen Because really and truly, most of the time, we don't trust God in the conversation to lead us to where we need to go. We're more concerned that it's my intellect that has to respond. Now, let me flesh that out by saying this. I think most of the time we have a really hard time trusting that no matter what the conversation is, that God has our back. Most of the time we're more concerned with me having the right thing to say. I mean, because think about it. If God is truly in control, I can take the time to listen to every single word you have and every single word he has, and I can fully rely on God to give me the words to say back or not say back and I don't have to be rolling this around in my brain as you're talking. We roll it around in our brain so fast because we're afraid that God is going to leave us hanging. But let me say this, doubting God's control in these conversations, do you know what it does? All it does is it speeds up our mouth, it slows down our sanctified minds and it resurfaces the old us. That's all it does. And I love how James is pointing this out. James is just saying, hey, be quick to listen, quick to listen, quick to listen, to which most of us would probably not put that on our profile. I love how one old preacher said it. He said it like this. They're the best. He says this. He says, one major part of self-control is mouth control. I like that. It's a lot easier to save face if you just keep the lower half shut. Not to mention, he says, it is difficult to put your foot in your mouth when it's closed. That's so, it's so profound, is it not? As the ancient proverb says, a closed mouth gathers no foot. Man, how often do we need to hear that? Proverbs 29, 11 says this in the King James Version. It says, a fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in until afterwards. Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, many words mark the speech of a fool. Even the old rabbis of old, would, they used to say this. They would say, hey, listen, God has given us two ears and they're out, right? They're exposed. You can see them. They're easily seen. But then they would say, but God put our tongue behind some iron bars. Why? To guard it inside of us and show that we ought to listen twice as much as we speak. If we had to put a disciple's name by this, it has to be Peter, Right? It has to be Peter. How many times did Peter think with his mouth instead of his heart? I can so relate, and I know that you can too. I got to think of this week about just illustrations for this point. And one of my favorite moments of Peter doing this was at the Mount of Transfiguration. 
It was at this moment where, where Jesus took Peter, James, and John. He took them to this mountain where, where, where Jesus was going to show them his glory, his true eternal state. He was going to rip off the humanity for just a minute. And you remember what happened? Jesus just transforms in front of them. He is in the air in front of them. And all of a sudden, at this moment that everybody should have been on their knees, should have been bowing, should have been in awe, should have just shut up and listened to God. What did Peter, what, what did Peter do? You remember what he did? He blabbed out. It literally says that he just blabbled out of his mouth. Hey, it's good for us to be here. Hey, let's build you guys a spot so we could stay here. And then in Mark's account, it says that he said this because he just didn't know what else to say. Man, I've been in that situation. Have you? Yeah, you have. I wish I could have seen the look on Moses' face and Elijah's face and Jesus' face. When, when Father God is trying to speak, and what is Peter doing? He's just running his mouth over here. He's just running his mouth. But man, this happens a lot. And I think we've all been there. What if we just learned to listen? What if we just learned to pause in conversation and just hear from the Lord and just hear from other people? Can I tell you two things that would happen? Number one, God would bless it. He will bless your silence. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that before, but he will. But number two, other people would respect us. And we respect Christians. You know why? Because sometimes Christians talk a little too much. Amen? But what is James saying? He's saying, hey, listen, listen, listen. Listen before you speak. That's number one. But keep going. I want you to notice this in verse 19. Watch this. Here's, he's going to show us number two. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and watch this. And slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. If you want God to bless you, be slow and listen before you speak. And here, write this one down. Number two, put a long fuse on your anger. Put a long fuse on your anger. That's my way of saying, because I'm a child of the 80s and every cartoon, somebody was blowing up. That's my way to say this. Just be slow to become angry. Just be slow. Now look closely at the text before you challenge me because James is not saying, he's not saying that you should never be angry. That's not what he's talking about, all right? We're gonna talk about that in a minute, but anger is an emotion that God has given us. It's an emotion. Anger is not a sin in itself. The problem lies in anger, in the quickness of our anger, the objects of our anger, and the response of our anger. That's where anger gets us into trouble. The word anger here is just the Greek word, Orge, O R G E. And it carries a stronger meaning than, ah, you just kind of upset me a little bit. That's not what it means here. The word orge here carries this emotional meaning that has a strong action, a strong punishment, or a strong wrath that is attached to it. In fact, it's used a lot to speak of God in the Old Testament when God was dealing with sin, that he had anger and wrath against that sin. James looks at you and he looks at me in this moment right here and he says, says, hey, listen, believers, listen, listen, listen. You are not perfect like God, so you should be even slower in your anger and your anger should always be pointed into the right place. You say, well, Matt, what is the right place? Where should it be pointed? It should be always pointed in a place that God has specifically told us that we should fight for. You see, there's a lot of people in churches, all right, not this church, but other churches. We've talked about this before. There's a lot of people in churches that really their main attribute of life is they are just an angry, spiteful person. You may even know somebody that's like that. There's a lot of believers that that is their life. There was a lot of believers in James's life that was like this. They're always nitpicking. They're always complaining. They're always arguing. They're always mad at somebody else. But listen, when somebody's life is constantly running into other people's lives and constantly angry, listen, it is a true sign that something is wrong with their spiritual life. Let me just tell you, the truly spiritually blessed person is not hypercritical. They're not hyperlegalistic. They're not nitpicking all the time. Again, the people that I know that have been truly blessed by God, that are godly people, they're really hard to anger. Do you know why? Because their gaze is not set on themselves. Because their gaze is not set on their rights. Because their gaze is not set on them getting their piece of the pie. Their gaze is set on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and they're okay. They're okay. And you're not going to affect them often 
Now, but hear me right, though. I'm not saying that we don't need to fight for those that we need to fight for. I'm not saying that we don't need to fight or roll over for those that are being abused. I'm not saying that we need to be pacifists in this earth. I'm not saying that we need to never stand and get a little heated when wrong is done or people are misrepresenting our God. But what I am saying is that it always needs to be a slow burn for a holy cause. It needs to be a slow burn for a holy cause. I was thinking of an example of this this week, and it has to be Jesus. Right? It has to be. He's the ultimate example for everything. I get that. But in this one, man, it just hit me specifically. Do you realize this about Jesus? Jesus could have walked on this earth every single day of his life in an absolute rage, and it would have been justified, wouldn't it? It would have been justified. Why? He came down from perfect and entered into sin. He came down from perfection and entered into a place that was against him. He knew what sin was doing. He knew the evils that were being acted out. And he even knew people's thoughts. But do you remember what Jesus looked like most of the time on this earth? He wasn't angry. And do you remember the times that he did get angry and did get upset? Jesus' anger was always controlled. It was always directed. It was always pointed at injustice. It was always moving in a direction for other people. A couple of examples. Do you remember when Jesus cleaned out the temple? Man, it was my favorite story as a little kid, right? My God has a whip and he'll use it. That was right. Yeah, I know. Do you know why Jesus got so angry that day? Because Jesus' anger was directed at the corruption and the commercialization of a place that was meant to represent his father, a holy God. And he fought for it. Remember when Jesus got angry at the Pharisees? There was a few times, but specifically for healing on the Sabbath. And he just got angry. He just got upset. Do you remember why? Because he was so mad at these so-called religious people for treating legalism above compassion for people. You remember when Jesus got mad at his disciples? Oh, I love this one. They weren't letting little kids come to Jesus. And Jesus is like, what are y'all doing? Remember that? Jesus showed his concern for those people that are often overlooked and marginalized. You see what I mean in this? Write these two things down. Maybe they'll help you this week. Jesus' anger, it was always righteous. It was always righteous. It was always rooted in the righteousness of God. It was never rooted in selfishness. It was never rooted in this uncontrolled emotion. It was always directed at a sin, at an injustice, at the mistreatment of someone else. But here's the problem with most of our anger. Most of our anger is not angry at these things. It's more mad that I'm not getting what I think I deserve and you're not seeing me how you need to see me. Am I right? That's where our anger comes from. It was always righteous, but secondly, it was always purposeful for the kingdom. Jesus' anger was always purposeful to present the kingdom. It was always constructive. It was always aiming to correct a wrong, to restore what was right. So let me just ask you, when you're seeing Jesus' anger, is your anger and Jesus' anger on the same track? Are you just an angry, bitter person? You say, man, I, I don't know. Let me ask you this. Are you bent towards quick anger? You say, man, I'm not sure. Well, well, okay, here's what I would say. If you're not sure, why don't you ask the people that are around you? Because they know, (laughs) amen? They know. Or better yet, ask your spouse. They know, right? (laughs) Or better yet, ask your kids. (laughs) That's not even fair, right? Ask your kids if you're bent to anger. And if other people say that, if you think that, let let me just say this. If that's you, why don't you just ask God to give you a new perspective? to give you an anger for the things that he says we should be angry about, to give you the peace and the patience and the righteousness of him. So that's the path of blessing. Number one is to hear before you speak. Number two is to put a long fuse on your anger, but keep going. Verse 21, he gives us the next one. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Number three, write this one down. The third step of righteousness or to to blessing in our lives is is to clean out the crud, all right? Clean out the crud. It keeps building. We, we've seen this, right? We're opening our ears. We're controlling our tongues. We have this calm spirit about us. And now James says, hey, clean out the crud, which is just another way of saying that you need to empty your heart of sin. You need to clean house, which is particularly relevant to our society of Christianity today. Why? 
Because for some reason, in our culture, we have stepped into this feeling as Christians that I can just go to church, I can be a good person, I can serve a little bit, I can possibly even teach kids, on a rotation of course, not every week, I can teach kids every now and then, I, I, can, I can serve, I can study the Bible, I can possibly control my mouth and my anger every now and then, but I'm really, this is where we've gotten to, I'm really not concerned about that stuff that's hidden in my heart. L- let, me, let me just say this and we'll move on. You can run as hard as you want to in the serving God department, but if you haven't cleaned the crud out of your heart, you're just running on a treadmill. You're not getting anywhere. You're not getting anywhere, and for sure, you're not inviting the blessing of God into your life. Why? Because you're just trying to live. You're just trying to do things for God instead of offering up those secret, possibly even hidden things in your life. But I can hear, James is just saying, clean out the crud, but I can hear the question, where do I start? Where do I start? Where do I start cleaning out my heart? Here's what I would say to those of us that this is our struggle. I would say start with the obvious and start with the known. Start with the things in your life that are obvious and that are known, that you know about. I would say start with the obvious and known places in your life that you just know that don't honor God. I think sometimes we get so caught up in trying to find those deep things of the Lord, right, that we don't deal with the ones that are just right there in front of us and obvious. And I'm pretty sure that you know the things in your life that are not honoring God. Amen? Can I get an amen on that? We know them. We know them. We don't like to talk about them, but we know them. And if for some reason you don't know them, once again, ask your spouse. They know them. Amen? Ask your kids. They know them. So how do you get them out? How do you clean out the crud? I would just say, this is not a message about that, but I would say, hey, first confess it to God instead of justifying it. Hey, Lord, here it is in my life, and I just need to lay it before you. Secondly, confess it maybe even to somebody that's close to you that can kind of help you be accountable in moving forward. Third, I would just say, ask God to redirect your affections, redirect what your heart is drawn towards. And then lastly, I would just say, ask God to replace the crud with a holy and righteous truth. I think we do all those steps very, very often, except for the last one. And we try to rid something out of our life without filling it back with something from God. And as a result, it just kind of oozes back to where it is. But James says, no, 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 fill it with the truth from God. In fact, look at verse 21. It gives us the next step of blessing. He says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word that is planted in you, which can save you. That's the next step right there. You can write it down. The next step of blessing is to humbly receive God's word. Humbly receive God's word. Now, what does this mean? Does that mean just I read God's word and I study God's word and I know God's word? Well, kind of, but when I say humbly receive God's word, it means that I do all of that, but I also bow down in submission to God's word. I bow down and I realize that it is the voice of God speaking into my life and that I'm not only reading it, I'm not only studying it, I'm not only memorizing it, but I'm saying, Lord, change me. You know, there's one simple question that determines if you're humbly receiving God's word or not. And you can write it down. I'll put it in your notes. Here's the question. What happens when I disagree with what the Bible says that I should do? That one question right there has changed my life. Let me tell you why. From the time I was probably eight years old until today, I've never, and I don't say this being braggadocious, I've never had a problem just reading the Bible. I just didn't. It was just, it was expected as a kid. It was what happened as a kid. It's kind of like getting up and brushing my teeth. It's just what I do most of the time, right? Here's what, here's where my problem is. My problem was reading the Bible and just closing it and walking off. That, that's where my problem became because I was just a good church kid, right? I was just a good church person. And so many times I would read something and I'd go, eh, I don't know about that one. And I would just kind of close it and I would move on. But that question right there, what happens when I disagree with what the Bible says I should do? This is the test. And here's why. Because when I'm humble, when I read something that maybe I've never seen, maybe I've never really thought through before, or is a blind spot that is in my life, when I'm humbly receiving my, w- w- the word from God, what do I say? I say, oh man, you know what? I've never seen it that way. I've never experienced that way, or maybe I forgot that, and then I will always follow up with, I've got to do that. That's humbly receiving God's word. The opposite of that is just reading and not receiving it and being arrogant and saying this. And oh, baby, I've said this before. God, you know what? You are usually right, but God, I think you missed it on this one. Yeah, there it is, huh? We've been there, haven't we? God, 
usually you're right. All right, you tell me not to kill somebody, I probably shouldn't. God, you tell me not to lie, I probably shouldn't. You tell me not to steal, probably shouldn't do that. But God, on this thing right here, I think you missed it because you know what, God? I'm special. I'm different. I've been created like this. I have been pointed like this. My culture has morphed from when you wrote this. You ever said any of those before? And God, I think you got it wrong. You see, the real issue is, is I am I accepting God's word even when it doesn't make complete sense? That's when I'm humbly receiving God's word and walking towards blessing. Am I accepting God's word when it goes against my heart, against my feelings? Am I accepting God's word when it is not what I think will work? Man, let's be honest. There are verses in the Bible that we don't like. Amen? Oh, come on. Come on. Get out of here. There are verses in the Bible that we disagree with. Why? Because we're sinful. There are verses in the Bible that we think we know better on. But God says, listen, if you want to walk in my blessings, you got to follow my way even when you don't think it's right. Because it's right. I was thinking about this all week. Oh, man, how can I illustrate this? And I was sitting in traffic the other day, and all of a sudden, it hit me like a ton of bricks what this looks like. Anybody use the app Waze to get anywhere? Anybody? Yeah, there's three of us. Come on. Billions of us use this thing, right? Maybe yours is Google Maps, whatever it is. I love Waze. You know why? Because it kind of makes things, makes going places brainless. I love it. You get in the car, you drive, and here you go. But every now and then, oh, you know where this is going, don't you? Every now and then, despite the fact that that app is tracking 50,000 people in that very moment, every now and then, I know better. Amen? Amen. I know better. I know how to do this in 5 o'clock, getting around the other side of Atlanta. I know. I did it when I was 16, and I know. I know. What happens every single time you go the other way? (laughs) Mm, 30 minutes later, you are not controlling your mind. Amen? Amen? 30 minutes later, you're sitting there. Listen, what, what have we done? We have, we have leaned on our own understanding. Now listen, Waze makes a mistake every now and then. I get that every now and then, but God doesn't. That's why he tells us so frankly, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Listen, God says, just trust me. I know the way. I know the way. And then what does he say? I want to show it to you. I want to give it to you, but I'm going to tell you this. He's not going to give it to you when you're choosing your own way. It doesn't just keep redirecting, all right? Eventually God's like, hey, go for it, go. Keep reading though. He doesn't stop there. Watch what happens. Verse 22, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Do what it says. So basic, so profound. Here's number five. Here's the fifth step, right? Just do what the word says to do. Just do. I know it's like, well, thanks, man. I didn't need to come to church for that, but it's true. Just do it. Let's flesh it out. What have we done? We've heard the word. We're humbly receiving the word, even when we may disagree with the word. And then we should just do what it says. It seems so simple. But the problem is many, many, many times we just think we know better than God. So we just don't do it. And what do we do? We do what I want to do. We do what I want to do. Now we'll make some justifying statement about it, or maybe we'll get around to it later, or maybe we'll hope that we'll redirect around. But we just do what we want to do and not what God wants to do. I thought of a few examples of this this week. How about generosity? How about in the world of giving? There's so many of us that are long-term Christians. We know exactly what the Bible says about giving our first and our best, but we don't do it. We just don't do it. We know what God says that if I do this, he will come behind my finances, but I have so many excuses. I just don't do it. I just don't do what it says do. How about, if that's not a struggle, how about the world of honesty? We know the Bible's so clear and that we need to be honest, right? At all costs, we need to be honest. But there's so many people around us that are lying and I'll never get ahead if I don't do it. And what do we do? We find ourselves falling in the trap and doing what we want to do. How about maybe bitterness or forgiveness? We know the Bible has commanded us to forgive that person. And listen, Matt, I can forgive everybody else but them. But them. I'm not telling you you need to be their best friend. But I'm just saying, we know what the Bible says about it, but we do 
what we want to do. How about flirting with that one temptation that's in your life? I don't know what yours is. For many of us, there's one or two areas. Maybe it's gossip or some kind of sexuality or some kind of pornography or pride. Your heart is saying go. Your mind is saying run for it. But we, we know that it's wrong. James says, look, if you want the blessing of God to mature you, if you want the joy in your life, if you want the hope in your life, if you want the fullness of God in your life, just do what the word says to do. No matter your feelings, no matter your opinions, no matter how you think you were born, no matter how you think the result will be trust God because he is the author of all things good just obey trust and obey there's no other way look I'm not sure when this changed but for some reason in America the single quintessential sign for spiritual maturity at some point swapped from obeying to bible knowledge I, I don't know when this happened but, you know, looking smart or having good theology and being deep. But here's the problem with that. You having a lot of Bible knowledge, yeah, it makes you smart and well-read. But I'm going to tell you right now, obedience is far more important than knowledge. In fact, I would go one step forward in that and say that most of us are well, 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 well more educated beyond our level of obedience. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that knowledge is bad. I mean, you can't act if you don't know. But what I am saying is, what are you doing with what you know? What are you doing with what you've been taught? What are, where is the fruit of your obedience? Let me show you why obedience is so important. Number one, obedience is the proof that we know God. Knowledge is not the proof that you know God. The, or the Pharisees would be prime Christians, amen? It's, it's what you do with that. Read First John this week. You'll see it all over it. It's the proof we know God. Obedience, secondly, is the goal of our life mission for God. It's the goal. Do you realize that the Great Commission says, hey, we reach them, we teach them, we baptize them to do what? To obey. We teach them to obey. That's what we're doing. When we are saved, our goal and life mission at that point is just to present ourselves before God. And number three, obedience is the key to being blessed by God. And it's all about obedience. And knowledge is important. Don't hear me wrong. But obedience, so much more. In fact, look what James describes, what happens to so many people so often. Verse 23. He says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. Now, look, they didn't have mirrors like we have them. It would have been a polished piece of metal of some kind. They would have just glanced over, but look what it says. And after looking at himself, he goes away and he immediately forgets what he looks like. What does that mean? It means that when the word does not affect you, yeah, you might have been aware of it for a minute, but it didn't change you. It didn't mold you. Therefore, it was never truly in you. So James says, look, if you want to be blessed, you have to live the word that is planted inside of you regardless of your feelings. And if you do, and if you follow these five, right, if you listen before you speak, if you put a long fuse on your anger, if you clean out the crud, if you humbly receive God's word, and if you do what the word says do, look at the result. I love this because this is what we all desire. Here's the result. You can write it down. We will be blessed to walk in the freedom and in the presence and in the power of King Jesus. Man, let's finish the text because it points to what happens. It points to how God wants to come around us in his plan of blessing. Look at verse 25. It says, but whoever looks intently. No, no, that's not a glance. That is a stare. Whoever stares into the what? The perfect law. That means God's law is perfect. It is not for you to change. It is perfect that gives what? Freedom. Do you know the Bible is not a bondage maker? It's a freedom giver. Now, when we live in sin, we feel like it's a bondage giver. But this gives freedom. Watch this. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it. It's not a one-stop shop. These steps are not, hey, glad I got that done. Let's move on. No, this is every day. Not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. Watch this. They will be blessed in what? They do matter. Are you telling me this is a works-based Christianity? No, no, no. So I'm going to tell you. He's writing to believers here that have already submitted their life to Jesus and God has already saved them. But what he is saying is this. If you are a believer, if God has truly transformed you, the litmus test of your life is going to be if I am submitting myself totally into the power and the presence and the love and the joy and the grace of Jesus. So here's the deal. Does God want to bless your socks off? Yes, he does. 
Now, he's probably not going to make you win the Powerball next week, but look, he wants you to have his joy. He wants you to have his peace. He wants you to have his presence. He wants you to have the fullness, abundant life that all of us that have been grafted into the vine and the remaining in him, he wants you to have that. He wants you to experience it. Is God powerful enough to do it? Oh yeah, he is. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. He is all powerful. He is all good. So listen, the, po- the, the, the problem is not the desire of God. The problem is not the power of God. I know this is hard to hear. The problem is us. We're the ones that are limiting the power and the blessing of God in our lives. We're it. Now, I know you didn't come to get kind of rebuked all over today, right? But the, but the other side of this is this, man, I sure would rather have it pointed out to me so that I can see it and so that I can walk differently than to continually live in where I am. And that's why James says, hey, no matter where you're walking, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's been in trial, whether it's been in blessing, God wants to bless you. So here's my question as we conclude. Which one of these this week do you need to put on tomorrow's list? And I want you to walk through every one of these, one per day this week. Which one of these that you need to just kind of camp out on this week and just say, hey God, I need you to change this in me. Fill me with your presence and only allow the things that anger you to anger me Allow me to listen. Allow me to humbly receive your word. Allow me just to do what you say do. And God, help me to clean up the crud in my life. I don't know where you're at today, but I can guarantee you one thing. One of those five is you. I could probably say three or four of me. And maybe one for you. But here's what I want to say to you. That if, if you haven't invited Jesus into your life, these things are not for you right now. What's for you right now is to see the offer of salvation that Christ has put before you because the blessing that you can walk into today is knowing that you know that you know that Christ has redeemed you. And he has saved you and he has put you on a path of eternal blessing for him. So if you haven't given your life to Christ today, today here's the deal. You can just ask him to come in and be yours. You can submit your heart to him right now and he will wipe your past put you into a future with him. Would you pray with me, Lord Jesus? God, as we walk into this moments of invitation today, God, I know that this is just kind of a super practical walk away today. But God, I also know that, man, these are heavy things that many, many, many of us struggle with. Lord, today, um, during these next couple of minutes of worship, God, would you you just begin now even setting people free and having them walk into your light and love and blessing. God, if there's people that need to give their life to Christ today, they can do that on the Next Steps app or they can just walk up to one of us that are over here by the Next Step banner and go, hey, I need Jesus today. And we'd love to talk to them what it looks like to surrender their heart to you. God, if there's people in this room that are just living in one of these five and they just need somebody to pray over them or with them today. God, that's what this time is for. It's for all of us to set our minds on you, to breathe in this space for a minute and just let the Holy Spirit just saturate our souls. God, thank you for these next couple of minutes. It's in your name. Amen.